that's the, just starting now. <laughs> um, so the first speaker tonight will be Lindsay Mitchell, um, a lecturer in law based at Strathclyde University. Welcome, Lindsay. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Georgina. Um, and I'm just going to share some slides. Um, so hopefully everyone can see that. Um, can you just tell me that you can see that, Georgina? Yes, yes, we can see it. Awesome, right. <laughs> okay. Um, I've done this before. Um, there's nothing worse than halfway through it, everyone saying we can't see. Um, okay, so um, thanks very much um, and hi to everyone um, who's joining us on this very wet and windy night. Um, I'm Dr Lindsay Mitchell. Um, I'm an academic in the law school at the University of Strathclyde. Um, I'm predominantly a human rights law researcher, um, but I have a strong focus on women's rights and lately I've been involved in a lot of projects looking at reproductive rights. Um, so I was asked to just give a brief overview of um, what is the legal position in Scotland, um, because again, for a lot of people who are not legal experts, um, things can get confusing quite quickly. Um, and it was just to make sure that you know everyone was using, if not the right terminology, but everyone had at least an awareness of where we were starting from and what some of the, the, the technical issues around decriminalisation might be. So I'm going to try and kind of keep this brief. Um, the recording will be available, the PowerPoints will be available, you know, you don't, it, this is not um, a lecture or anything, but it was just to give people um, a bit of brief information. Um, so this is actually um, a bit of a chat about where we are in Scotland and what the law in Scotland says about um, abortion. But actually, before we can have a look um, at the law in Scotland, I think it's like, quite important that we um, take a quick look um, at the law in England and Wales, just to give some context here. Um, and the reason for that is that many more people are much more familiar with um, the law on abortion as it stands in England and Wales. And quite often, unfortunately, if you are reading things online, if you're maybe looking at blogs, um, you know, if you're just perhaps looking at things in the media, um, quite often when they are talking about the law, they will actually refer to the law in England and Wales. Um, so just to give everybody a little bit of refresher, or if you're new to this, um, in England and Wales, abortion um, is a criminal offence, and it's criminalised by a piece of legislation called the Offences Against the Persons Act. Um, this is a piece of legislation from 1861, uh, which was passed during the reign of Queen Victoria. So as you can imagine, it's pretty old. It uses um, some really archaic language. Um, if you look at the original um, text of this legislation, it actually says that the penalty for um, procuring abortion is penal servitude. Um, and it talks about you know, people being sent to the colonies. So this is really not the sort of legal framework that anyone would want um, governing modern healthcare. Um, but just to make people aware that this act only applies in England and Wales. Um, it used to apply in Northern Ireland. Um, that's obviously a whole different circumstance, so we'll not get into that. It has been repealed in respect of Northern Ireland. It still applies in England and Wales. Uh, so that is still good law. Um, and we are aware that there are currently women in England and Wales being prosecuted um, under this legislation. But one thing to note is that this legislation does not and has never applied in Scotland. And often that is one of the, 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 the mistakes that people often make as a starting point. Um, if they're talking about decriminalising abortion in Scotland, often people will put forward the argument about repealing, which basically just means removing um, a statute from the book. So people will talk about um, repealing the Offences Against the Persons Act, which is what the campaign for decriminalisation in England and Wales is all about. However, the situation in Scotland um, is, is a bit different. Um, depending on who you talk to, it's either a little bit simpler or it's a little bit more complex, depending on uh, where you are. Um, within the argument. Um, so that's England and Wales. Now to give people just a little bit of context about where we are in Scotland. Um, again, this will be familiar to most people, but Scotland has its own independent legal system. And even after um, union with England in 1707, 
Scotland retained that independent legal system and you see that quite a lot um, in Scottish criminal law. So many people are familiar with the fact that, you know, the criminal courts and the criminal system in Scotland is quite different from England. People, you often hear people in the media in England, they will talk about people being charged with, with manslaughter or GBH. These are not crimes that exist in Scotland. We would use terms such as culpable homicide or assault. So one of the big differences about the criminal law in Scotland is that we tend to not have pieces of legislation that criminalise certain activities. Um, in Scotland, much of our criminal law is governed by what we refer to as common law. Um, basically, I mean, you, you could sit through a two hour long lecture on this. I'm not going to subject anyone to it. Um, so basically, in simple terms, it just means that Parliament hasn't passed legislation um, the extent and interpretation of the scope of much of Scotland's criminal law is done by the Scottish courts. So what that means for the criminalisation of abortion is that there is no one piece of legislation or no one piece of statute like there is in England that criminalises abortion. So that both makes things a little bit simpler, but it can also make things a little bit more complex because we can't just point to one piece of legislation and say, let's put it in the bin. Um, so some of the starting point um, for you know, people who do legal research or who are interested in legal history is to go back and look at some of the historical cases um, of abortion in Scots law. So I dug out a couple and I had a look. And one of the things that becomes clear is that I think even some of the eminent uh, legal professors of the day, these were obviously all men. So I'm not entirely convinced that abortion was something that was really on their radar. Um, there isn't a law written about it. Um, but one of the first recorded cases of abortion as a crime in Scotland um, is a man called John Fenton, who was prosecuted in 1761. Um, and there is reference um, in some of the, the sort of eminent criminal scholars of the day um, from the, the sort of 18th and 19th century. One of them referred to um, abortion being being tried as murder in 1627. Now, we don't know the facts or the circumstances of any of this. Um, so it's very difficult to see anything other than the fact that there were historical prosecutions. So it was quite clear that the common law in Scotland did historically view abortion as a crime. And I think it's probably fair to say it still does. Uh, where things get a little bit complicated though, um, is that, um, you know, with the rise of, of medicine and modern science, once we got to the 19th um, and 20th centuries, um, an abortion very much became something that, you know, male doctors were becoming involved in. Um, there is a view of, among certain people, certain legal scholars in Scotland, um, but previously amongst uh, the medical profession as well, there was a view that Scotland did not criminalise abortion and that prior to 1967, it was not a crime for a doctor to, um, you know, to, to, to carry out an abortion um, if that was what the woman wanted. So, um, for instance, uh, the famous gynaecologist Sir Dougal Baird uh, he claimed in 1975 that abortion had never been a crime and that he had provided abortions in Scotland over a period of 30 years and happily did so, um, convinced that he was not engaged in criminal activity. Um, there's also various uh, historical records that show that abortions were carried out, some abortions were carried out in the NHS in Scotland prior to 1967. Now, again, we don't know the circumstances. We don't know if these are, are women who were already miscarrying. We don't know if this was to save people's lives. We so There's very little um, that we can see on this at the moment, or certainly that I can see on this. Um, but this was the view, certainly, of some of the, the eminent legal scholars um, and some of the, the leading um, you know, medical doctors of the day that um, it was a mistake um, and anyone who thought abortion was a crime in Scotland prior to 1967 was confusing themselves with the position in England. Um, and one of the, the leading legal encyclopedias um, stated in 1936 that a therapeutic abortion was not a crime in Scotland and would not be charged as a crime unless 
the provider displayed criminal intent. Um, and this is one of the sort of legal standards we use in criminal law. Um, so for the prosecution to occur, the Crown would have to prove a wicked and felonious intent. So basically what they're saying here is that the law, the common law would be able to tell the difference between someone who attacked a pregnant woman and caused her to lose her baby versus a doctor who was providing a therapeutic abortion. One of those could be criminal and one would not. So this is where a lot of the very historical legal debate is. Um, you might think, well, why are you telling us any of that? I'm telling people this basically just to say um, that one of the biggest objections when we talk about decriminalising abortion in Scotland is that often a response, that an automatic response that we get is that people will say, actually, did you know that abortion is not actually a crime in Scotland, Lindsay? Um, so this is something that comes up and again and again. Um, my personal opinion, and, and I'm probably not the, the leading authority on the matter, but my personal opinion is I'm not sure any of that legal debate actually matters. Um, what we do know for certain is that in 1967, correctly or incorrectly, um, the Abortion Act um, was passed by the Westminster Parliament. It applies in England, Wales and Scotland. And if you have a look at the legislation, the way it is worded, it makes very clear that it considered abortion to be a crime in Scotland, in England and Wales. The Abortion Act obviously um, still applies. It's good law in Scotland. Um, and the Abortion Act says, it states quite clearly in section 5.2, that any abortion that is carried out, out with the strict parameters set out in the Abortion Act remains a criminal activity. So this is the framework that we have to work with. So I'm often not convinced about some of the value of looking at you know, what sort of old men previously said. However, when it comes to law, that is something that you know we spend a lot of time looking at and reading. So there is a lot of precedent there. There are arguments to be made um, around Scotland's common law. I think though that we cannot get away from the fact that at the moment, abortion in Scotland is governed by the 1967 Abortion Act. And it makes clear that an abortion that is not, that, that takes place out with the framework set out in the Act is a criminal activity. Um, and what's more, in the, the Supreme Court said in the case of Dugan, which was the, the case brought by the Glasgow midwives that some people will be familiar with, um, in 2014, the judges in that case, they were of the opinion that um, abortion was criminal in Scotland and remained a criminal activity um, if it took place, again, out with the parameters of the Abortion Act. So the Abortion Act is this constricting framework, and I'm sure this is something that Audrey will talk about in much more detail about her personal experience. But I'm sure, as you, many of you know, um, it requires the permission of two doctors, um, and it said that you know abortion has to be carried out um, on you know medical premises, and anything that deviates from that is potentially criminal. Um, and this operates as a bit of a straitjacket. So, for instance, in 2017, um, when the Scottish government amended the regulations that allowing women's homes to be classified as an approved place so as to conform with the Abortion Act and allow women to take the second abortion pill in their homes, this was immediately challenged in the courts by SPUC Scotland. They lost the case, but again, they appealed. Um, so this had to go to court again. Um, so legal challenges are really time consuming. They're really expensive and this creates delays. Um, so this couldn't be ruled out until you know, we had a judgment um, from the courts saying that the Scottish government did have the power to approve a woman's home as a place to take pills. That would mean, therefore, if she took the second pill at home, it was not criminal, and therefore that fit within the constraints of the Abortion Act. Um, and again, during COVID, again, when the Scottish government uh, put in place temporary measures um, to allow women to take both pills at home, it made very clear that it was doing so just as a temporary basis for the pandemic. 
And I think one of the reasons behind that was that they were very much worried that anti-choice groups would bring a legal challenge. And I think people were really worried that, you know, we would struggle with abortion provision during the pandemic at all then. So one of the big things about the Abortion Act and the framework around it is just how constricting it is. I'm sure Audrey will speak in more detail about this. And the fact that how abortions happened in 1967 is obviously very different from how they are now. But the fact is the way that the, the legislation is written, even if you want to change something because it will benefit women, even if something is now good practice or it makes things better, if it doesn't fit within the narrow terms of the Abortion Act, basically it is still a crime. So this is why we talk about decriminalisation and this is what, what we mean. We are talking about removing this criminal, this criminality, this criminal framework um, from abortion. Um, so I'm often asked, you know, well, why does this matter? Why would we bother? Um, you know, if, if we're not even sure abortion is a crime in Scotland, if prosecution is unlikely. And what I would say to people, um, just quickly to finish off, is that just because certain laws are, are not being enforced at any point in time, it doesn't mean that they won't be enforced in future. So again, if you look at England and Wales, previously, if you, if you look at Northern Ireland over the last 10 years, um, there hadn't been prosecutions for abortion. And then all of a sudden in the last five or so years, we see women in England and Wales, um, we saw women in Northern Ireland being prosecuted for procuring their own abortions. So who's to say, you know, we've seen what's happened in America, who's to say that this cannot happen in Scotland? So it would be better to clarify the law. Another point just to quickly make as well, that although this is very, very rare, it is possible to bring a private prosecution in Scotland. And again, we know that anti-choice groups are very well funded. We know that they are happy to use the courts to frustrate abortion care. So there is always the possibility that they would fund a private prosecution, even if um, the Crown Office took a view that you know, it was not interested in pursuing a prosecution, there is always the possibility that an anti-choice group might do that. So I think these are some of the reasons why it makes sense that we want to think about decriminalisation, we want to think about removing those criminal penalties, and what we're saying is that abortion is no longer a crime, it would be a wholly medical matter, it puts patients first, and it allows doctors to provide health care. Um, what we do not mean is that we are not saying about deregulating abortion. All we are simply saying is that there would be no criminal penalties. So in the same way that, you know, lots of healthcare is very, very highly regulated and it's all about patient safety, in the same way with abortion, that would remain the case, but there wouldn't be these criminal penalties or sanctions overhanging how abortion care providers carry out their job and how, you know, women have to have to undergo their abortions. And just finally, to sort of finish off, it's worth pointing out that many, many countries across the world, um, I didn't have time to, to, to provide the full list, but many, many countries have already decriminalized abortion. Um, and usually um, the statistics and the evidence that comes back from these countries is that it's actually better. Um, usually this, the evidence suggests that this allows women to access abortions quicker. Um, so there's quite a lot of support for, for decriminalizing abortion um, internationally. And I think it's quite important that, you know, if Scotland and the UK as a whole, if we see ourselves as, you know, people who, who care about women's reproductive health, then, you know, I do think we need to move with the times um, and, you know, we need to sort of follow the footsteps of other countries who are, are rapidly overtaking us um, and how they, they regulate abortion um, within the law. So um, that was just Hopefully people found that helpful. Um, obviously, I'm happy to take any questions for anyone later. Um, and as I said, the slides and stuff um, will be made available. So I'll stop the screen share now and I'll hand back to Georgina. Hi, sorry. That's great. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, so our next speaker is Audrey Brown. Um, an abortion care doctor and chair of the Scottish Abortion Care Providers Network. Over to you, Audrey. 
Thanks, thanks, Georgina, and, and thank you for the invitation to, to speak this evening. Um, so as, as Georgina says, I'm a doctor working in abortion care. I've been providing abortion care in NHS Scotland for over 30 years. Um, and I currently uh, lead the abortion care service at Sandyford in Glasgow. I also chair the Abortion Care Providers Network in Scotland, which brings together clinicians working um, across across Scotland, providing health care. Lindsay's talk was was absolutely brilliant. Um, and even as someone working in abortion care, it, it's really good to just remind us about that background um, to um, abortion law and how that, that currently sits. I was sort of laughing to myself when Lindsay mentioned historically about old men sort of pontificating around abortion law and abortion rights. And uh, unfortunately, those old men haven't gone away. And I think we can all think of uh, older men who are currently uh, interfering in abortion provision in Scotland. Um, so what what I wanted to do was um, take you through really a journey which which covers patients and abortion care providers uh, experience of working um, with the abortion law as it stands in Scotland. Um, what I, I, I think you'll find is that this shows that the abortion law currently is very frustrating for staff and patients. It delays treatments. It uh, causes unnecessary Un unnecessary demands on staffing. There are the risks of prosecution and the stress that that can bring. And it can also sometimes be used as a tool to, to delay um, people's access into abortion care. So I'm going to illustrate um, a, a number of points with, with sort of patient stories. One of the things I want to look at is how the requirement for the two doctor signatures can impact on care. I want to show you how the Abortion Act is used to very much limit the role of other healthcare providers like doc like nurses and midwives in healthcare. Also, the Abortion Act um, restricts the location of where an abortion can take place, even although there have been some changes recently around medical abortion medications, there are still restrictions on where mifepristone, the first abortion drug, can be taken. And I also want to, to show you that actually the abortion law as it stands in Scotland discriminates against women who have an abortion request. So the first person I'm going to talk about is a 25-year-old woman. She's come in to um, a clinic um, for an abortion consultation. She's seen one of her, her doctors in the clinic. They've had quite a detailed discussion about her situation. The doctors carried out a scan. She wasn't um, sure how far on in the pregnancy she was. And the woman turns out to be 12 weeks pregnant. She's unable to continue with this pregnancy. She has a number of um, personal uh, circumstances that she feels this is not a good time for a pregnancy and she couldn't cope with a pregnancy. Now she is now 12 weeks pregnant so she doesn't meet the criteria to be able to do a home-based uh, medical abortion. She'll require to do the second part of her medical abortion in the hospital setting. So the doctor that's seen her looks um, at what availability there is in the hospital. Many of you will be aware that um, the time interval between the first and second parts of abortion needs to be between 24 and 48 hours. Luckily, there's a, a space in the ward in about 24 hours time. The woman is very keen to get ahead with her treatment. She's distressed about being pregnant um, and, and she, she really wants to proceed to, to the abortion treatment. However, the clinic that the doctor is working in and the patient has attended only has one doctor on clinic that day. There's another doctor working in the building doing a different task, but that doctor um, is a conscientious objector and, and wouldn't uh, wish to participate in, in any part of the abortion care. So this patient is keen to go ahead with treatment. It's clinically very appropriate, but the doctor only has one signature on the certificate for abortion, their own signature. So what do we do in this, this situation? We can't proceed to abortion without a second signature. So do we send the woman away and delay her abortion until the next space is available? We look at the um, ward admissions and realise that the ward's booked for the rest of the week. The next admission is going to be a week away. 
or does the doctor give the patient the first tablet to take um, and get the form signed at a later date the following day? Well, that way, going with the law as it currently stands, that would be criminal because the woman would have started the abortion procedure without the appropriate legal paperwork in place. So technically, both of them would have committed a crime. So the only situation, the only solution there would be to delay the women's abortion until the appropriate legal paperwork's in place. And of course, we know that whenever you delay an abortion, when abortions become later, risks increase, the woman is more distressed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So removing the need for that medical approval wouldn't put the woman at any additional risk. There'll be clinical protocols. The woman will have informed consent. The drugs will be exactly are, as they are just now, but it'll mean like as someone could for any medical procedure, the clinician looking after them and the patient make the decision between the two of them and the treatment goes ahead. So the requirement of the, the two doctor signatures certainly can delay and impede um, timely care. The second person I want, want to tell you about is um, someone who's, who's younger, she's 18. She has come into the abortion care clinic and had a consultation with one of our very experienced abortion care nurses. Um, there's our, our nurses work in a very extended role, so they've done the entire consultation, found out about the woman's situation, her medical history, her needs, etc. The nurse is also trained to do a scan and has done an ultrasound scan, confirming that the woman is in early pregnancy. She wishes to do a medical abortion at home and is keen to start that as soon as possible. The nurse has obtained a uh, consent from the woman for the, for a medical abortion at home, but we then come to a sticking point. The nurse can go no further. She's able to provide really quite an extensive consultation and care package, but she can't proceed any further because she doesn't have two signatures from doctors. So she's then placed in the situation of if she's working in a large clinic or in a hospital, running around the hospital, trying to find someone who can come and see the woman, provide a signature, etc. Now, we know from previous research about people um, accessing abortion care, one of the things that they find distressing and upsetting is having to repeatedly tell their story to different people, having to justify their decision to different people, and that stress of we're trying to find someone to sign a certificate to give you permission to get an abortion um, it is not a good situation for someone to be in. It's stigmatising, they feel vulnerable, they feel unconfident that they're going to be able to get an abortion. The other um, issue that arises is without the medical uh, input there, there is no uh, prescription for the abortion care drugs, which does seem quite ridiculous. Many nurses um, now are, are non-medical prescribers, so they're, they're, they're trained and qualified to prescribe a wide range of medicines. Um, nurses can pres prescribe drugs for cardiac drugs for, for heart disease. They can provide prescribed control drugs, including morphine, diamorphine, etc. But they are not allowed to prescribe mifepristone, the first drug um, in the, the abortion, uh, medical abortion package. Now, there really are, there's probably very few drugs that are actually as, as safe as mifepristone to take. Mifepristone is deemed by the World Health Organization to be an essential medicine, which saves people's lives, but nurse prescribers are not allowed to prescribe it. So again, the Abortion Act is really very much limiting um, the role that nurses and midwives can actually play in, a, play in abortion care. Um, it seems it, it seems uh, really to set back um, nursing and midwifery practice. So we'll move on to case three, which focuses on um, the the location of abortion um, and where that that can take place. So uh, this woman is is twenty nine. She uh, does a telemedicine abortion consultation with our service. Um, she. Has, has phoned in, she's spoken to one of our 
uh, doctors or nurses on the phone. She absolutely sure of her decision and she's early in pregnancy and she wants to do an early medical abortion at home. As Lindsay mentioned, um, the in 2017, <clears throat> Excuse me, the law was amended to allow women to take misoprostol, the second tablet at home. But at the start of the pandemic, there was a, a further change to allow women to take both parts of medical abortion at home, as long as they met certain criteria. So this patient meets the criteria to be able to do an early medical abortion at home. However, as part of the, the consultation and discussing her reasons for abortion, she's explained that she is unfortunately living with a very controlling partner. She's in the process of, of trying to um, move on from that relationship, but hasn't yet managed to do that. She knows that if her partner finds out that she's pregnant, he will absolutely force her to continue with, with the pregnancy. So she doesn't want to do that. She's very sure she wants to go ahead and, and have an abortion. It doesn't suit her to have the medicine pack delivered to her house, um, either by post or by courier, because as I say, the partner's very controlling. She fears that he would open the pack, he would destroy the medicine, etc. So, so she comes up with a, a plan that she wants to collect the medicine pack from the clinic and then take it to her friend's house. Her friend knows about the situation, her friend's trying to support her to be able to escape the relationship, and she wants to do the medical abortion at her friend's house with the support of her friend and distant from the, the partner. However, the law doesn't allow her to do that. The law around early medical abortion at home only allows the abortion to take place in the patient's place of residence. So we're then faced with a further choice. Does she take the medical abortion pack and hide it in her house? But then there's a risk of him finding out. If he finds the medicine, she thinks he'll destroy them and not allow her out, she'll be forced to continue with the pregnancy. Does she go into hospital? We could organise for her to go into hospital and do the medical abortion. Um, that would be a legal place for her to do, do her abortion, but that would mean a delay until we can get a hospital bed organised. Um, it means she's got a further journey to be able to travel to hospital. He limits her finances, so she's not sure she would be able to afford that extra journey to get, get to hospital. Or do we just turn a blind eye to the fact that she's already told me that she's going to take the medicine pack to her friend's house and do it there? But then, of course, she would be committing a crime, carrying out an abortion in a place that's not approved. And I guess I would be... Uh, a party to that crime if I knew it was taking place. So the law, although it has improved over the past few years on place of abortion, it currently is still very limiting, particularly for people in difficult circumstances. The same could apply, um, we have seen this on occasion, that perhaps someone who's a student uh, studying in England um, and uh, they're registered for health care at their, their place of study. They've become pregnant and they've had a consultation with one of the abortion providers in England and have received an abortion, a uh, medical abortion uh, care pack, either by post or collected it from the clinic. The, the young student then confided in her mum, who said, oh, come back come back up for the weekend, I'll help you through this, I'll support you, etc. So the, the student pops her medical abortion pack in her bag and travels to Scotland to do her treatment at home with the support of her parents. But again, that that is not permitted by law. Women who are living in Scotland um, can have medical abortion at home provided by prescribers in Scotland, but it would not be permitted for someone to be prescribed drugs for use in England and then to move to another country to do the treatment. And the, the same would happen vice versa. If I provided uh, a medical abortion pack to a student studying in Glasgow who then took the pack back to her parents in Liverpool, for example, that would not be compliant with the law. So the other um, challenge that I want to uh, touch on um, follows on from that, and it's really restrictions around where someone can take um, the mifepristone, the first part of medical abortion. 
This is a 34 year old woman um, who's, who's contacted the clinic. She knows that she's nine weeks pregnant. Um, she actually lives in a, a, a rur more rural area and it's about a two hour journey from her home into um, the hospital in Glasgow. So she's nine weeks pregnant. She wants to have her abortion done in the hospital setting. She doesn't feel confident about self-managing abortion at home. Um, she's had a miscarriage previously and had quite heavy bleeding, and she would feel much more comfortable doing the second part in the in the hospital setting. So, so that's fine. We can organise that for her to come uh, down and go into hospital in a few in a few days' time. But she asks. For the first part of the tablet, I know I need to take that 24 to 48 hours before. So could you post me that tablet up? And that would save me that round trip of at least four hours to come to the clinic. Um, and unfortunately, the answer to that is no, because medical abortion at home and the taking of mifepristone at home can only be delivered in the, under the current law as part of an early medical abortion at home package. So this woman, because she wants to do the second part of treatment in hospital, the law as it stands would not permit her to swallow that mifepristone tablet in her home setting. It has to be swallowed in a hospital or a licensed premises. So the woman is then facing a real di dilemma. Um, as as is the clinician, should we just post it to her anyway and maybe nobody would ever know, but that would then be uh, illegal and none of us want to be in the position of breaking the law. She asks, could I, could she pick it up from her local pharmacy? But again, a pharmacy is not currently deemed an appropriate place um, to get a medical abortion tablet. So the woman um, then thinks, well, should I just do the home the home abortion anyway? It wasn't her first choice, but that's perhaps what she wants to do. The irony then being if she did decide to do that, I could post her the whole medical abortion package. So I could then post her um, the first tablet, the second tablet, pain relief to use along with her treatment, etc. But I wouldn't currently be allowed to send her the first tablet for abortion. Or as happened in the end, the woman a uh, made a journey to the clinic in Glasgow, two hours each way on a bus with two children under five for one of our staff to say, hello, here's your tablet, which she swallowed and then went back home again on the next bus. So although place of medical abortion has improved, it's not working very well for all patients. And then finally, I wanted to, to touch on um, how the law as it currently stands for abortion discriminates against women who have um, a pregnancy that they wish to, to terminate. So I'll example this by um, a scenario of two women who are attending um, the early pregnancy unit. So these are, are two women who've had bleeding in early pregnancy, let's say about six weeks um, pregnant. They both had a scan done. It's uncertain how the pregnancies are going to proceed. And as would be usual, the early pregnancy unit then arranges for them to come back the following week for a, a further scan. So women A, let's say she returns the following week her, she has a rescan done she's continued to have a bit of bleeding and the scan shows that the pregnancy has actually stopped developing so she's she's had what what you may term it an early pregnancy failure which would then go on and become a miscarriage so the midwife that's seeing her at the early pregnancy unit um, offers her condolences for the, the pregnancy not continuing. She discusses the options for management. There's a possibility of just waiting on a miscarriage. There's a possibility of using the same medication as medical abortion to induce um, a miscarriage, or she could have a surgical procedure carried out. The woman uh, doesn't want to have a procedure carried out in hospital. She's keen to manage her miscarriage at home, and she would like that the miscarriage to, to be induced as soon as possible. So the midwife is able to support that choice. She's able to prescribe the medicines that are required for inducing the miscarriage. Those medicines are mifepristone and misoprostol, exactly the same as we'd use for abortion. And the woman leaves that day with her treatment and goes home to, to miscarry um, over the next day or two in the comfort of her own home. Woman B, um, 
Again, she comes for her, her re-scan. Her scan um, shows that her pregnancy has continued. She's about seven weeks pregnant. Um, the difference is that her scan has a so-called as fetal heartbeat, as it would be called, which is really a, a pulsatile movement, um, but her pregnancy is viable. She explains to the midwife that's seeing her that there's absolutely no way she can continue with, with the pregnancy. She'd really hoped it would be a miscarriage. She's already got three young children and couldn't possibly take on any more. Unfortunately, the midwife can't help her. The midwife isn't allowed to prescribe mifepristone and misoprostol to cause um, an early medical abortion um, and the only way for her to get an abortion is to then be referred into the abortion service so this results in a delay until the woman gets an appointment at the abortion service she goes there she has to repeat her story again and explain about the three young children and her inability to cope and she then requires to have her medicines prescribed, exactly the same medicines as women eat, but hers need to be prescribed by a doctor and two doctors need to sign a certificate to give her permission to have an abortion. So really, um, the Abortion Act, two women in early pregnancy, um, they're not able to be given an equal choice of options and a midwife can prescribe treatment for one woman but not for the other woman and that is solely because one woman's scan had some cardiac activity and the other ones didn't. Uh, equally well woman B who had the viable pregnancy if she was then happy with that and she decided she was going to continue the pregnancy then she would go on to antenatal care she could be looked after throughout her entire pregnancy by midwives she could have her baby delivered by midwives there would be no requirement necessarily for any medical any medical involvement everyone accepts her choice and everyone supports her choice and she doesn't need any permission to go ahead and have a baby and be responsible for a child for the next 16 years but if woman B wants an abortion, she needs to get a certificate signed by two doctors to give her permission. She needs a doctor's prescription and she needs a further consultation. So I think hopefully that journey through those, those cases would, would demonstrate to you that there's numerous situations where the abortion law actually inhibits person-centred and modern care. It discriminates against people who wish to terminate their pregnancy. Um, and I, I certainly think it's time that abortion law needs to be modernised for, for care um, appropriate to this, this day and age. And that view is shared by um, really all the professional bodies that are involved in care of pregnant women. So the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists, Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Health, Royal College of Nursing and the Royal College of Midwives are the professional bodies that govern people providing abortion care and they all support decriminalisation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Audrey. Um, no, that was really interesting. Um, so I would now like to um, ask Alice Mumford from Ingenda to speak. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Georgina, and thank you to um, Lindsay and Audrey. That's been just absolutely brilliant. And I'm not, I'm not going to speak for too long because I, I want to hear more from you, really. Um, but uh, Engenda are Scotland's feminist policy and advocacy organisation. Um, and so we work to advance women's equality in, um, in all sorts of uh, different areas from public transport through to healthcare, of course, which is one of the reasons we talk so much about abortion. And because it is a keystone feminist demand, um, it's really at the heart of, of women's rights um, to, to allow women uh, rights over their own body, over, over their own life choices and over their own health care and well-being. Um, and so decriminalisation is something we've been um, calling for, along with abortion rights Scotland, for, for a very long time. Um, and often that conversation can can turn into, and Lindsay touched on this, but why bother pushing for um, decriminalisation? It's not really a problem, um, it, the, the myths around it not even really being um, criminalised. Um, and it can be seen as, a, as an either or. So it can be seen as saying, well, either we should talk about decriminalisation 
or we should talk about improving services and um you know and, and we know that access to abortion is not great um for people um in scotland in many ways and we've already had a question about people having to walk past protesters um but as Audrey's shown there is that clearly the the law has an impact on this service provision so it's not an either or we can't just talk about improving services without examining the legislative underpinning of how we talk about um, women's reproductive rights and bodily autonomy clearly we need both um, and we need to be talking about decriminalization um, at the moment because the world is is showing us that we cannot be complacent when it comes to abortion rights um, and and women's reproductive rights um, in general. So we've seen obviously the overturning of Roe versus Wade and the sort of the the almost instantaneous attack on women's rights that's come from that and the reduction in provision. Uh, we've seen the prosecutions happening in England and Wales. And of course, um, we've seen decades of, of this in um, across the island of Ireland um, in in women being criminalized, um, stigmatized um, and attacked for trying to have some sort of say over um, the, the timing and size and manner of their, their families and their lives. Um, but we also need to be talking about it now because there is there is chance for change and it's that that's a, a nice way to be talking about it in that we think there is hope um, that we can actually make this happen and, and bring about those changes that Audrey's talking about, bring about that clarity and by removing it from the legal system and making it purely in healthcare that Lindsay talked about. And in Scotland, services are improving. Um, we've seen the move to telemedical abortion. We've seen um, movement on buffer zones. We're not there yet, but... And globally, the trend is towards better abortion provision. You wouldn't think that from looking at the news necessarily, um, but actually we've got papers and I can share them in the chat and in the email that goes out afterwards that show that globally, the trend is towards women's reproductive rights. Um, it's towards better services. It's towards re removing abortion from the criminal justice system. Um, and that's that's great. And we should be at, not just part of that movement. We should be at the forefront of that movement um, in saying that actually this is a fundamental women's right and we're, we're going to remove it from the criminal justice system. Um, one thing that's often tricky and one of the things I was asked to talk about is where where political parties in Scotland stand on this issue. Um, and so where, where are the levers for change? How likely are we going to get this through? And it's quite difficult to know. We know that the public in Scotland is, is pro, well, pro, pro women's rights to choose um, and pro abortion. Um, and we don't know a huge amount about politicians and that's partly because the work hasn't been done um, in terms of the, the intensive polling that's needed and public, you know, and, and um, surveying of politicians. But it's also because historically parties have been quite cowardly in talking about this. It's been an issue that um, has often been left up to, you know, in, individual politicians and MSPs being given a free vote on this. Um, it's maybe been something that parties say, well, yes, of course, in principle, but we get a bit icky when we're talking about the details because we're all women. Um, and and it's it's seen as a polarizing issue. And actually, again, if we look at public opinion, it's it's not necessarily that polarizing. Um, so it's sometimes difficult to know where parties and even individual politicians stand on this. But again, that is something that's changing. And I think that's one of the very few positives we can see from things like the crackdown on abortion rights in the US. So we've seen a sort of emboldening from people of, of talking about this. So both in the US, certainly if you, you know, spend time on Twitter and things, you'll see a shift from people saying, um, you know, well, of course, women should be able to access abortion. I'm pro-choice. Um, you know, in these in the in the in in extreme circumstances or in these cases, and that's something we hear again and again. And it goes back to what Lindsay's talking about with the law. You know, well, fatal fetal abnormality, health of the mother in cases of rape and incest, and it, it, conversation is often sat in that sphere of like if a woman really needs the abortion if something terrible's happened. You know, she should be able to access that. To actually now people saying, no, I'm pro-abortion. I'm not just pro-choice, I'm pro-abortion. It's a good thing. It, it can liberate women. Um, it can be good for society. Um, and this is absolutely a thing that we should be proudly saying. Many, many women in Scotland access and, and others who can become pregnant access in Scotland. Um, this is a thing that can have a positive impact on people's lives. The most common emotion people feel after accessing an abortion is relief. 
Um, and we shouldn't be talking about it as this thing that happens in extremis. And we're seeing that with political parties as well. So we've got a motion coming to SNP conference this weekend, um, which affirms abortion as a fundamental human right, as well as talking about those services. Again, saying we need to attack this from both sides. We need to improve the experience of women and other pregnant people accessing these services. But underpinning that, we need to say, this is, a, this is a human right, this is an issue of women's rights, this needs to sit within healthcare and not within criminal justice. Similarly, we've seen local authorities reaffirming commitment to women's rights, saying that they want to be the, um, the test cases for buffer zones. Um, and that, that sort of horror that's happening in the US is making people think, well, that's, that's not what we want here. And actually it's not that far away from happening. Um, so we do need to, be, uh, we need to be open and and vehemently supportive of this as an idea. And we're seeing change, other changes in Scotland that will enable this conversation to happen. We're seeing the incorporation of various um, UN human rights instruments and of particular interest to us is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Um, so the CEDAW Convention, which is coming into Scots law, it's going to be incorporated. And this could be a chance to say, look, we've got this, on the one hand, we're saying we support women's rights, we're, we're um, we're incorporating this treaty into uh, Scots law, but on the other hand, we're saying that this fundamental issue of healthcare is actually um, potentially a prosecutable offence. Um, it just doesn't work. So there are these really exciting opportunities coming. Um, and so I'm really pleased that Engender and Abortion Rights Scotland have been able to sort of pull this together and that, that folk are here to talk about this issue, because I really do think that now is the time to be having this conversation and to be bringing about um, yeah, the decriminalisation that I think we've all known for a long time is badly needed in Scotland. Um, so I'm going to finish up there and hand back to Georgina and uh, get to some of your questions. Thanks. Thanks, Alice. Um, yeah, so thanks very much to all our speakers tonight. I think the information has been really interesting um, and enlightening for a lot of us. Um, so we're now going to move on to consider some of the questions that have come in. So we've got a couple of, um, had a couple of questions through in advance. So I'm just gonna run through those um, now and um, see um, if any of the speakers would like to come in. So one of the questions we have is, uh, where do the speakers think that objections could come from um, and how do we best prepare for that? Would anyone like to come in on that? Do you want me to start, Georgina? Yeah, if you could, Lindsay, yeah, that'd be great, thanks. And just, I mean, I think, and I'm sure everyone here is familiar with this, you know, this is the campaign for reproductive rights is, this is not something that a lot of people have just started doing, you know, this is an ongoing thing. Um, but I think the one thing that is really starting to depress people is, is not just what's happening in places like America, so we see this roll back, but is the fact that the the, the money that funds what ha is happening in America is starting to kind of percolate, you know, across Europe and, and, and within Scotland. So I think, you know, whereas previously we were able to say, oh, here is a particular group of people within Scottish society who, for whatever reasons, um, you know, they will never agree with abortion. They're not willing to sort of understand or get on board with it, it, it it's almost for them it's just a, an ideological position I think there is obviously going to be that there's obviously going to be you know the, the like religious conservatives I think the worry though is that with this money that you know how much influence then is being bought to you know encourage you know ordinary people who, who generally are in favor of abortion so I, I think there's those who traditionally have always been opposed to abortion and have always campaigned against it um, and the traditional anti-choice groups. But I think we also need to think about, you know, rather than this just being people who write letters or voice their concern, you know, I think we do need to sort of look at, and this is where the US I think is so important, I think we need to look at some of the tactics. So I think that there will be legal challenges. I think, you know, people will use the law. I think people will use social media. I think they will use, you know, every sort of arsenal that, that they have. So I, I think in some ways, people who are against decriminalisation will not just be the sort of classic objectors of, you know, of any change in the law in Scotland, you'll get people who say, well, why bother? You know, if you're not, 
if you're not, you know, creating a utopia, why bother doing anything? I think there'll be that. But I think there will be these traditional hardcore anti-choice groups. And I, I think we really need to kind of worry about how, how we might see that manifest. Thanks, Lindsay. I suppose another question that leads into that um, is, I suppose, is it very likely there's going to be a legal challenge um, to any changes that we want to, to want to bring forward? Um, yeah, and I'm conscious of the fact of, of letting other people speak, but um, I attended the First Minister's um, summit on abortion on behalf of abortion rights and this was one of the things that, that, that we discussed and the politicians there were, were, were very open about and they understood. I, I don't even think we're talking about this in chances of. I think everyone who is involved in this is very aware there absolutely will be um, a legal challenge and then that just frustrates everything and I think for politicians as well that that creates issues because it just means that any changes will take so much longer than any ordinary legal changes will because I think this would go all the way to the Supreme Court and um, that's incredibly time consuming but it's also incredibly expensive and I think that's the sad thing about this we could be spending money doing other things but people are going to have to spend an awful lot of money you know paying lawyers to take this to court so I, I think it's not a case of oh, what, what's the, the likelihood I mean this will be challenged. Yeah, I'll perhaps come in and in, in that as well. And, and Lindsay touched on it earlier when um, the the relatively minor change to allow women to take the second part of abortion at home um, was challenged. It went to appeal, and that process uh, cost a huge amount of money. It caused a lot of of distress and stress for for people seeking abortion care and clinicians providing abortion care that. Um, were services going to be able to continue? Were we going to have to reverse um, plans that we had had put in place? So I don't, uh, like Lindsay, I have no doubt that there will be some very big um, challenges to to any any legislation to change um, abor the abortion act in in any way, um, and. We have we've been aware, obviously, over the past few years that there is increasing money coming largely, largely from the US to support anti-choice activity in in Scotland and England and Wales as well. So, yeah, I do have have concerns about that. I think as well some of the the narrative which then follows any discussion around decriminalisation then becomes very, very frightening, very alarmist. Um, and there's then inference that it would just be a complete free for all. People would be aborting babies up, up to the very second before the gas breath, etc. And of course, of course, that's not going to be, be the case. And I, I would always take the example of you know, having having your appendix removed because you've got appendicitis doesn't require uh, any any law around it. You just have it done because you need it done. Um, but but someone wouldn't be allowed to if you've got a sore tummy, cut you open in a kitchen table and do an ap appendicectomy because there's there's clinical guidance, there's there's rules, etc. There's protocols around that. Certain people will be allowed to do procedures. Other people won't be allowed to do procedures. So. Um, I, th I think we need to try and keep control of that. That um, otherwise people can't may well be frightened into saying, "Oh my goodness, if we decriminalise, this will be completely out of control. People will be having uh, awful um, situations because there's then no control over abortion, which it will be controlled in the way that um, and overseen in the way that any other medical treatment is." Yeah, just to come in there, I think, and I think that's a really good point and it's also what we've seen from sort of you know the anti-equal marriage campaign like this sort of playbook of um you know extremists well could I marry my dog you know yeah so what can I you know can, am I just allowed to kill a three-year-old no that's not what that is so um yeah I think being prepared to, and, and knowing that those attacks will come is, is really important but that also when the question was first asked I was just thinking about the um the repeal the eighth campaign in Ireland which I think is a really really good model for 
um, how to do this. And um, I know lots of lots of campaigners went over. I was one of them to you know to to spend some time with that campaign, help out, and try and learn from what they were doing. Um, and one of the things they did so incredibly well was personal stories, and that's why I think it's great to to hear from Audrey tonight because it's actually something you don't hear about a lot. You know, it's we know that abortion is still incredibly stigmatized, and also lots of people don't know what happens in all sorts of medical operations. I also don't know what happens in in uh, when you have your appendix taken out. But so um, yeah, so that sort of lesson from them. But the other reflection that links in with this from the repeal of the eighth is that 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 they had lots of really tough conversations within the coalition of groups doing that about how much they talk about um abortion as healthcare about care about um you know yeah something that some women need on some uh, and is a difficult decision those sorts of things versus saying my body my rights um and and eventually they went with the sort of softer we want ireland to be a caring you know nurture people and and they did that because that was what was going to win for them. It was like, we need the result. We need the result. And there were lots of women's groups that were, were uncomfortable with that because they felt it did play into this idea that abortion is difficult and traumatic. And actually, they wanted to be saying no. And I think that's the same with some of these extremist things. Now, obviously, some of them, as you say, no, you know, the way to get unsafe abortions is to make them criminal. That's when you get that's when you, you know, that's why we use a coat hanger as a symbol for this. It's not about decriminalizing. But there are also people that say, yes, I should absolutely be able to, you know, there should be no time limits. And and I think we've rightfully not talked about time limits because it, it does get into that messy space. But but again, there's that question of saying, well, of course, that wouldn't happen. But let's have a philo like philosophical conversation about why we're why we're legislating women's bodies. So I think to not, yeah, to maybe not get um, drawn into that is another good lesson, I suppose, from that and actually say, what's the what's the goal here? It's decrim. Um, and and also, I think it, it it is a risk. You know, it absolutely is a risk, not not because decriminalization will mean that women are aborting babies in the streets, but because opening up legislation and conversations means that the, the right and anti-abortion folk and anti-choice people will attack and they're good at it. You know, and, you know, we will talk that the world is scary and there's money coming in and um, shout out to um, Open Democracy, who are doing lots of really interesting work, like trying to look at where this money is coming from. And I re recommend sort of looking at their investigations in this. But um, it absolutely is a risk. And I think the way we we overcome that is being prepared for it as as campaigners, um, knowing where our allies are and making it watertight. There will be litigation. Absolutely. And so, again, thinking what like strategically, how are we doing this? Where's the money coming from? All these things. Um, and that's why it's so important to have these conversations and talk about it and because we need to be ready when the opportunity comes like with covid that happened and people because we'd thought about telemedical abortion there were already calls to allow women to access abortion at home it was very obvious covid's hit women cannot get to clinics right let's get this in place and then it's much easier to make the argument well, you can't withdraw that now. You've given this ability to, to women, to uh, medical practitioners. So yeah, being I think being ready is the key thing and yeah, and, and expecting it and knowing it's gonna happen, but that there's more of us than there are of them. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, thanks you guys, that was really good. Um, so we've had um, another question. Um, somebody is asking if, is it true that women are getting sent to England um, from Scotland for abortions? Um, and if so, uh, why is that? I don't know if, if Audrey, if you can shed any light on that. Yes, currently um, there are a very small number of women who are, are largely people who are between 20 to 24 weeks pregnant. So up, up to the, the uh, legal limit for abortion. Currently, um, none of the health boards in Scotland are able to provide abortions above 20 weeks for women who are requesting an abortion. Um, I think that the reason for that is there's a particular um, set of skills, I suppose, that a clinician would need to be able to, to do an abortion at that stage. It would either be um, a specific surgical procedure which would require additional training and skills to be able to do that or there is a possibility of a medical procedure which requires a pre-treatment procedure to ensure um, 
the the fetus wouldn't have any any signs of life and currently there isn't anyone in Scotland um, who is able to provide that care for women seeking an abortion for for their own choice so I Last year, there were around 40 or so women who were between 20 to 24 weeks pregnant who were unable to get care in their own health board and um, their NHS board paid for them to access that care um, through one of the uh, abortion care providers in England. Previously, it was a higher number of women. The numbers have come down over the past few years. I think going back four or five years, there was probably about 100 women a year had to travel to get care. But even although the numbers are small, that's still 40 or so women um, that are not currently getting care in NHS Scotland. And I think it's something that that was touched upon in the, the First Minister's summit earlier in the year, although that wasn't the main topic of the summit. It is something that, that is is under discussion um, in Scotland, as, as we've discussed, abortion law is devolved. Um, government wrote to um, health boards within the past few months, um, advising that all boards are expected to provide abortion care at least up to 20 weeks and asking boards to look at how we can work to provide a later abortion service in Scotland. Um, so I think that would likely perhaps be a couple of boards that work together to provide that very specialist care for uh, women across Scotland. And it would require realistically at least a couple of doctors to, to undergo um, that additional training to be able to provide that care. There, there's no sense in training one person because then if they're off, um, the care can't be provided. So I think it will move forward, um, but currently um, it's a gap in service. Can I just jump in there as well and say yeah. that, yeah, I mean, and this is talked about quite a lot, you know, women are being sent down to England and obviously that is, it is shocking. People should be able to access the service they need as close um, as close to the as themselves as they can. But I suppose I just wanted to say that provision for women in the islands and highlands, um, we, we see people traveling a really long way to access abortion services, even within Scotland. Um, you know, and if you look at some of the islands and the way the ferries are set up, that's a three day visit to get, you know, to get through to Inverness about getting um, childcare, about maybe losing income if you're on zero hours contract, contracts, about all those things. So um, while it's while rightfully people are talking about women having to go down to England, um, it is it is worth highlighting that actually women are having to travel long distances and at, you know at cost in various ways within Scotland as well. So I think again that's where the principle of abortion need, needing to be as local as possible um, is really really important. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And obviously, the number of people needing earlier abortions is much, much greater than the number number of people requiring later abortions. I think, excuse me, telemedicine has made a huge difference to many of the women in those remote and rural um, locations. As you say, from the Western Isles previously, you would have had to travel over to Rigmore and Inverness to be seen. Um, now with telemedicine consultations, as long as someone is suitable for telemedicine, um, if someone from the Western Isles contacts our clinic, we'll do a telemedicine consultation and then we send their abortion care pack by recorded delivery to, to their home. So they should get that with, within a few days of the, the consultation. But yeah, I absolutely agree. We need to look at making sure that everyone can access care as, as, as close to their, their home and with the minimum disruption possible. I think it's um, a good point to raise, though, that in Scotland, um, obviously, the majority of abortions are carried out on the NHS, which which is great and something I think we should be really proud of. Um, obviously, there are a lot of issues that need to be addressed and stuff like that. But um, I think that is is a source of uh, comfort, at least. <laughs> um, so another question we have is. Um, would it be a long parliamentary and legal process to decriminalize abortion services here, which I assume the answer is going to be a yes. Um, as what's the kind of, in terms of, Lindsay, you were talking about other countries that have managed um, to decriminalize abortion. Uh, what can we learn from the way they've gone about doing it? Um, I mean, I think you can, we can learn various things, but again, Obviously, lots of different countries have, have have different legal systems and therefore they have their own 
sort of pros and cons and how they do it so often often a lot of places they will simply a lot of um places so for instance australia um, they did it state by state so in some ways that sort of dealt with parts of the more conservative parts of the country um, you know where there was most opposition um, where it was done on a state by state basis and I believe that all the states have now changed the legislation so it's been decriminalized across Australia um, obviously for, for reasons that we all understand places like Australia and Canada their original legislation um, on abortion tends to mimic what you have in England and Wales. A lot of their statutes are basically just um, a sort of mirror copy of the Offences Against the Persons Act. So for them, often it's quite easy because they can say, well, these are sort of colonialist era legislation. It's not fit for purpose. And it's very difficult to make an argument for keeping that. So in some ways, there's 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 ways there that, you know, it, it's easier for to do. Um, it'll probably be slightly different in Scotland. But I think what Alice said is, is, is absolutely key that you know we need to look at how people have have done things um not just um in the republic um but you know the, the sort of sustained efforts in northern ireland about you know because abortion provision there has, has has really been the untold story in the uk and their sort of continued efforts um you know to have and obviously it's still an ongoing situation there because they don't have provision of care really but you know, they managed to get decriminalisation through um, there. So I, I think it is, as Alice says, it, it's about trying to network. It's about learning from the work that other people have already done. But obviously, uh, we will need a very specific Scottish context. And I think a lot of that will be done, um, you know, by people who work at the Scottish Parliament and draft legislation. And, and there'll be lots of consultation and lots of people will respond to the consultation. So it will be an own, it will be a sort of drawn out process, but hopefully it's one that we can start to get the ball rolling on. That's great, thank you. I suppose because um, we don't have, like you were saying in your speech, we don't have um, the 1967 Act to kind of, sorry, the Offences Against the Person Act, but um, is it worth um, coordinating with um, the movement in England to repeal the 67 Act altogether? Because that sounds like that would make it a lot easier if we could just get rid of that whole thing rather than trying to add lots of amendments onto the conditions around abortion. Um, I don't yeah, know how I possible mean, that is. I think, and I think people are doing that. I think you, you probably want some sort of UK context obviously you know we do this with lots of things you know people um across the UK sort of coordinate but there will be specific legal differences between you know Scotland and England the problem with simply getting rid of the abortion act of 1967 is that well that that would leave you with that still leave that just leaves abortion as a crime and you don't have the framework so you have to do both but yeah there there is an argument of do some people would say let's just start from the beginning let's just decriminalize it and then let the medical profession as Audrey said you know plastic surgery is regulated you know getting your appendix out is regulated dentistry is regulated you know we, we don't need these really old-fashioned pieces of legislation that you know put in place these really narrow parameters and as Audrey said the requirement for two doctors is is a real bugbear when it comes to providing care and often anti-choice groups will say oh if you decriminalize abortion you're removing these safeguards that protect women and actually the requirement for two doctors in the 1967 act is not about protecting women the act specifically says and the the you know the debates around this were about essentially getting women to change their mind it was about making clear that they knew that how serious this was and you know there was a lot of moral shame and stigma and that is written into the 1967 act so you think even the legislation that permits abortion actually when we look at it from today's you know how we view things it's a really misogynistic piece of law so yeah I, I would say Georgina we, we could do with getting rid of that and we could do with getting rid of the, the criminal penalties but this is something that I think we're going to need to have a wider conversation about. Yeah and just on that like paternalistic sort of nature and, and punishing women again that's what we're seeing in the US with heartbeat laws um, when we see anything about well a woman has to have um, a cooling off period or counselling or yeah has to see the you know the image of the scan like really horrific stuff like it gives me like it 
you know, it, that's the that's the legacy of that, and that's the continuation of that. Of that, women don't really know their own minds and their own bodies. Um, and yeah, just on the like, actually, how we do it, I think I think Lindsay's totally right. We need to be um, having these conversations with other groups, but also attacking it from all angles. And that's the beauty of you know a coalition like the abortion rights movement is that you've got academics and you've got campaigners and you've got you know I'm, I'm thinking I mentioned seed or earlier the UN convention and that's now being incorporated and the way that happened was you know some campaign like campaigns on the ground talking about it people within parliament doing the work and in gender commissioned um, a legal expert on this to say look, what does this actually look like you need an expert in Scots law to say look we'll do the work for you like what would happen and I think we need that as well to say you know yes is it just deleting these two lines you know what does that mean and um, certainly when we wrote um back in 2016 we you know and gender wrote a, a report on abortion which I'll put the link to and a lot of that when we were getting to recommendations the answer was always the guidance. It was like actually this stuff we it already you know these these medical guidance already exists. So it's about changing that. It's about changing those um, yeah those provisions rather than anything actually in law. So yeah, this idea that it would leave a vacuum um, is yeah nonsensical really. That's great. Thanks guys very much. Um, so I think just uh, one last question. Um, Somebody's just asked, um, how do we go about supporting um, clinics, basically, uh, in providing this um, this vital service um, in the light of the anti-abortion rallies and the increasing anti-choice activity and intimidation that's going on? Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe speak to that first, having been a per personally affected affected by it at my place of work. I think. Um, we we just cannot allow these people to in, intimidate women um, accessing clinics and to intimidate um, doctors and nurses providing care. It's it's just unacceptable in in this day and age. And I, I really don't think it would be accepted or tolerated for any other aspect of healthcare if people went outside a transfusion unit to object about people donating blood and having blood transfusions that would not be accepted so why on earth we accept it for abortion care is is beyond me and obviously it's a, a a different issue from what we're talking about just now but um the the discussion around buffer zones is obviously um very current um and i i think my my feeling is that there's certainly cross party support in the the parliament to to see see this through um it's a uh, it, it's just very intimidating and upsetting and I, I i get very annoyed with some of the discourse that's on social media saying that oh no well we're we're not um harassing or intimidating people were if they if women feel harassed and intimidated that's their fault that was not our intention which is you know exactly back to bullying violence against women uh, emotional bullying and it's just it's just unacceptable in any healthcare facility that's great thank you audrey um so I'd like to thank um, everyone for their for their time tonight, um, especially our speakers. Um, really, really great job. Um, very interesting and lots of information, I'm sure, for us all to think about and work towards going forward. Um, and as I bring the meeting to a close, um, I'll just ask each of the speakers um, to give a final comment. Um, and if we haven't been able to take all the questions or if anyone thinks of any questions to ask after tonight, um, this is only the beginning of the conversation um, and Abortion Rights Scotland, along with Engender, will be arranging further events in the coming months. So to do keep in touch. Um, so, Alice, would you like to start off with the closing comments? Sure, I think just to, just to echo your thanks, really, and, and to you, Julian, for sharing. Um, it's been, yeah, I feel like decriminalisation is, is becoming something that was a bit of a techie conversation into a thing that people are talking about and feels like could actually happen which is super exciting and to have um yeah people giving up their Thursday evenings to come and talk about it and listen about it is um is testament to that so um yeah I think just uh, I, I find it really powerful to hear those those two elements together so from Lindsay talking about the you know the legislative history and 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 how that is still having an impact on women's lives and then Audrey still sort of really bringing it home with those stories from women so um yeah uh I mean, I think I said it when I spoke first, but I, I do, I'm, I'm not 
naturally always that optimistic but I do feel like this actually is a thing that that could happen and I, I feel that both through through fear from looking around the world and hope through looking around the world so um yeah looking forward to future conversations thanks that's great thank you Alice Lindsay can I move to you yeah although it's 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 kind of hard to follow Alice there um yeah I think that was such a sort of awesome note of of you know kind of confidence and optimism rather than as you say the sort of usual pessimism and yeah just thanks to everyone it's been so good to have these conversations and I think that we do see this as a as a continuing conversation there's obviously some things that we've not been able to get to or, or, or touch on so yeah everyone is welcome to to come and join the conversation and obviously thanks you know thanks to everyone for for having us for having me um and obviously as always you know for for Audrey to take the time and actually as Alice says you know bringing home the reality of this because I think for so many people it can be a sort of a hypothetical or an ideological discussion and yet you know I think we're talking about people's lives and often people when they're at such a vulnerable part of their life and Audrey always kind of makes that point really eloquently so yeah thanks to her and um, thanks to Engender and thanks to Chris, uh, Georgina for doing such an amazing cheering tonight. Oh, thank you. As you say that, I can't get my mute button to work. <laughs> um, Audrey, if you'd like to finish this off, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much to to everyone. It's been a, a really enjoyable evening and a really enjoyable panel to take part in. I think, um, yeah, I think abortion care um, and people's abortion journeys are they're unnecessarily complicated by the the laws it stands it just shouldn't be necessary for an aspect of healthcare for a lot of people is very straightforward it's very safe and it's very uncomplicated i think women's rights to choose are have been put into the position where they're being controlled by doctors and i think most doctors actually don't want to have the legal control of that most doctors would say it's up to the woman to choose and why should i have to sign a, a certificate to give permission um so i think yeah i i equally feel um quite positive about the situation it is good to hear the discussion taking part in lots of different taking place in lots of different settings and and for once I, I do feel optimistic I think we are on on the the brink of, of something and it's really good to be able to grasp that enthusiasm and hopefully bring lots of people on board with us to really push for a change that will improve women's rights and women's choices in Scotland. Uh, thank you very much. I'd just like to say um, thank you to all our speakers again for doing such a wonderful job and thank you for everyone who uh, has turned up and listened and engaged. Um, it's been really productive, I think. Um, and also thanks again to Engender for making this event possible tonight. So um, we will send out um, one email to all of tonight's participants after this, um, just with information on how to sign up to Abortion Rights Scotland for information on future events and, and campaigning that we do. Um, this will include details of meetings that are going to be taking place in Glasgow on Thursday the 10th of November and in Edinburgh on Saturday the 12th of November, and also how to access the link for the recording of this event tonight. So I'd just like to leave by saying, um, do get involved. Um, change comes when we organize together and we look forward to working with everyone in the future. So thank you all very much indeed and uh, good night. <laughs> Bye, thank you. <laughs>